time Muhammad is doing his thing, Christianity had been around for 600 years. Uh, Christians were well established. Uh, he knew Christians. In fact, uh, Muhammad had several uh, Christian contacts at first, and people that, that uh, he tried to convert to his heresy. Um, so he was familiar with Christianity. He listened to Christian scriptures. He was also familiar with Judaism and listened to the reading of the Old Testament. There are many parallels. In fact, um, in, in following lessons, we'll look at the Koran and some issues in that. But there are many parallels in the Koran to the Old Testament and, and even references to the New Testament. And there are parallels to the Jewish legal writings known as the Mishnah. So he heard these things and he incorporated them into his scripture. Um, at any rate, uh, Christianity then being around for about 600 years. Uh, Christianity was partially in the area where Muhammad and the Muslims were, but, but not yet, uh, not, not so much yet. To begin with, uh, he, uh, he attacks his own people, his own tribes. Mecca was possessed by his tribe the tribe he grew up with. It's his own people. And he wages this war against Mecca. He, uh, he supposedly sends a message to the leadership in Mecca that he's going to, uh, that they have two options, convert or die. So it's the same options that Islam still provides people today. And they dug a trench around it, cut people's ability off from leaving. They laid siege to it to starve people out. And eventually, the tribes of Mecca gave up. So he, he takes Mecca, and that's their big thing. That's, that's basically um, their, their origin spot. This is a, a big deal, Mecca, to them. Now it was, you see on the handout now, uh, shortly after his sack of Mecca, Muhammad is said to have received the following revelation from Gabriel. If you weren't here last week, uh, Gabriel, he claimed to receive the Koran in various revelations over a 23-year period from the angel Gabriel, which only he saw. Uh, and, and supposedly, it would even appear to him in the midst of other people, and nobody else could see it but him, and nobody else could hear it but him. Uh, at first, he actually thought it was a, a demon. So, I mean, if, if, if this actually happened, how do you mix up that? But his wife, we talked about this last time, had a great test to determine whether it was a demon or an angel. She took her clothes off in front of it, and it ran away. Therefore, it's an angel, because a demon would have hung around. Great test. At any rate, uh, this is a revelation now he receives from this angel, Gabriel, which was undoubtedly a demon. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This is the beginning point of this, this jizya thing is, a, is, a, is protection money. They call it a tax. It is flat-out mafia-style protection money. You pay not to have them kill you. So if you want to be a practicing Christian, and this people of the book thing, that's the Bible. Uh, that's what they call Christians, people of the book. So from among the people of the book, uh, you don't have to kill them all, but they have to pay this protection money with willing submission, not just pay it, but they've got to feel the burden of it with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So it has to be a burden on them. And in lands where there are Christians, in Muslim lands, they do have to pay this tax, and it's flat-out protection money. They don't pay it, they get attacked by Muslims and beat up and killed. It's just playing the mob. 
Uh, and in some cities, some places, Christians have to show deference. If, if they meet a Muslim on a street, they have to step into the street or into the, into the gutter, get away from the Muslim, yield to him if he walks by. They have to dress differently so they're immediately identified as Christians. I mean, they might as well have to wear Star of David on their, on their shirts like World War II Nazis did to the Jews. Uh, that's how Muslims treat Christians. Uh, both Jews and Christians at first started off, and still really have, well, not so much Jews, but started off having preferential treatment among the Muslims. If you were a Hindu uh, or a Buddhist or some such thing, you were just plain killed like that. Uh, but because Muhammad believed that Christians had part of the truth, and Islam does look at Jesus as a prophet, they have allowed Christians the privilege of living, although under this this feeling of submission, this burden they place on them. So that's how kind they are to Christians. What do they believe about that last day? The judgment day? Mm. Um, hold that forbidden, believe in Allah, nor the last day. Yeah, actually, we, hopefully we'll get a chance to look at that today yet, but they do believe in a judgment day. And they even have a, a form of a messianic figure who's going to arrive to usher in the judgment day. And they believe in, a, in an antichrist. And that's why I say a lot of their beliefs parallel scripture in places. Because Muhammad heard it. He was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. But he could listen. And when he would retell it back to be written down as a Quran thing, he would mess it up. So his stories are not the same as the ones he heard. They're versions of it, but it shows what a lousy listener he was when you see how it diverges. All right, next point, next uh, asterisk there. During these raids, women and children were captured and often sold as slaves. Muhammad received several revelations giving permission to his Muslim followers to have sex with them, even if they were married. It is also permitted to buy them for a time. That is prostitution. Here's the section out of the Quran. And, uh, let's see, and married women are also forbidden, except all that you, all that should be your right hand possesses. What, what that means is if you have captured them in a raid or in a war. So if, if you possess them, if you've captured them, um, you, can, you can do what you want with them sexually. This is the decree of Allah for you. And it is lawful to you, besides this, to seek out women with your money. And that, this is great, chased without fornication. So whatever you enjoy, buy it, their sexual parts, from them, so give them their wages. It's an ordinance, and there will be no sin on you about what you have mutually agreed on after the ordinance. Yeah, I love it. Go ahead, buy prostitutes without fornication. Now, how does that one work? Evidently, it's not considered fornication if you're paying for it. Of course, it's also not considered fornication if you're raping somebody that you've captured. It's only considered fornication, really, if it's a fellow Muslim woman. Then, then she has some protection under law. Next page. Uh, Muhammad, on the other hand, and this is, this is typical throughout. There was one standard, one revelation in the Quran for the rest of the people, and there's always these special little revelations for Muhammad himself, which gives him the extra privileges none of the rest of them have. So Muhammad was given greater liberties. Oh, you prophet, surely we have made it lawful for you, your wives whom you have given their wages, and those that your right hand possesses, which Allah has granted you, and the daughters of your paternal uncle, and the daughters of your paternal aunts, and the daughters of your maternal uncle, and the daughters of your maternal aunts, those who emigrate with you. And a believing woman, if she gives herself to the prophet, if the prophet desires to have sex with her, this is a privilege for you, but not for any other believers. Indeed, we know what we ordain for them in their wives and what their right hand possesses, that there may be no shame on your part. 
Now, that's a, that's a curiously convenient revelation um, because it allows him to, to have relatives if he wants them. And for ma that matter, any believing woman if she gives herself to the prophet. Well, what's convenient about that is one of his wives happened to have been his daughter-in-law. She was married to his son. Uh, evidently, she was very attractive. Uh, she had a thing for him. He had a thing for her. Uh, he called his son in. His son evidently, I mean, daddy murders whoever gets in his way. So his son was, hey, you want her? She's all yours. And he backs off and then uh, consequently marries her. So these little revelations, and this is, this is, again, another thing you see when you look in the Quran, when there are revelations about Muhammad himself, they all happen to be very convenient with the things that he wants in life. So uh, as an example of how he gets the special privilege, here he can have any woman he wants, uh, including relatives, um, much more so than anybody else. Uh, 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 um, a Muslim man is allowed to have four wives, except Muhammad. He can have as many as he wants. All of, the, all of the loot that they got from their raids and their attacks, he personally would always get 20% of the total for himself for future expansion. So, you know, it's a great gig for him. He's filthy rich. He gets 20% of everything anybody takes. Many women as he wants. Um, he's, he's got the good life going on as far as the Muslims are concerned. But not anybody else. Now contrast that again to, to Christ. And the way that he submits himself under the same law. And, and though he is God, he doesn't live above the law. There's no special laws for Jesus and laws for the rest of us. He humbles himself under all of our laws to keep them all for us because he knows we can't. You know, this is, this is so opposite Christ. It, it really, it truly is an anti-Christ, everything he stands for. It's completely anti-Jesus. All right, back to the handout. Uh, yeah, as if this wasn't bad enough, Muhammad has said in the Hadith, that's the uh, writings that explain the Quran, to have married his wife Aisha, who was his favorite wife out of a minimum of 12 that he had, when she was six, and to have consummated the marriage when she was nine. And he had anywhere from 12 to 25 wives. That is actually still practiced in Islam. Uh, you, you may occasionally see pictures in the news or online of grown Muslim men standing in line with a bunch of nine-year-old girls. They marry nine-year-old girls. That's acceptable. Why? Because the prophet did it. Whatever he does is acceptable, except for those special revelations where, you know, he gets the stuff nobody else does. But it is acceptable in Islam to marry prepubescent girls. There's, in fact, there is even a line in the Quran to fathers that says something to the effect of, um, be sure that when your daughters reach the age of menstruation, that they're already married off. Don't let them, don't let them reach that age in your own home. Islam is, is a brutal religion from the beginning. Uh, and why any woman, you know, it just blows my mind that these, these women are running to join ISIS. What, what ISIS is doing, what, what they represent is this Islam. Not the clean-cut, westernized, pacifistic Islam. And there are different kinds. ISIS represents... 7th century, 600s Islam. That's what they are striving for. So if these, these, these girls that go to, to Syria to give themselves to Islamic fighters are putting themselves into this, 
they're not going to marry a Muslim man, which is what I think they think they're doing. They're going to go get a Muslim fighter for a husband and support him. No, they're going to become one of a bunch of women the Muslim fighter is sleeping with. Um, they're going to be treated a step up from the dog. I, I had a relative, actually. Not a blood relative. Let's see, what was she? She was a daughter of my step-grandmother who married a Muslim guy. The night of their wedding, as soon as she was married, she was told to sleep on the floor at the foot of the bed. That was her place, right where the dog would sleep. And she told, she told my step-grandmother that he was so nice before we got married. He, he was the perfect gentleman. I opened the doors for her, all the chivalry stuff. But as soon as they got married, she became the dog. No. No. And divorce happens pretty easy among Muslims, too. Why? They go through wives pretty quick. Once you get in there, you can't get out either. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, I saw a guy in the interview the other night. Uh, he just read the book. And that's the way it looked to me. I mean, that once you were involved, you couldn't get away from it. Yeah, if you, if you are a Christian, if, if you can establish the fact that you are a Christian, um, you are allowed to live, provided you feel subdued and pay the tax. If you are born a Muslim and you become a Christian, there are no chance, second chances. You, you are killed. This, the penalty is death. And, and you may have seen that just recently. This woman, a doctor who was a Christian, was sentenced to death. Remember this? This was less than a year ago. Sentenced to death, had a kid while she was chained to the floor in an Islamic prison somewhere. Their claim on why they were going to execute her, even though she said, but I'm a Christian and I've always been a Christian, their claim was, um, you may think you've always been a Christian, but your father was a Muslim, therefore you're his property, therefore you were born Muslim. That was the court's argument. And it stuck in the Islamic court. Women don't have an opinion. They don't, they don't get to establish right or wrong. Whatever... If the father is Muslim, whatever dad says or is applies to the daughter. So dad was a Muslim, you're automatically a Muslim. Even if your mom baptized you as a Christian, as an infant raised you as a Christian your whole life. So she was sentenced to death. All right. Um, contrast all of this kind of now. Three, three Bible passages at the end of page four. Contrast all of this to Christianity. Matthew 5, 38 to 44. Matthew 5, 38 to 44. Uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's Christianity. Islam has no corresponding passage in the Quran like this. Uh, and, in, and in fact, not that long ago, I read a quote from an a Islamic imam who mocked Christians for having a passage like this. That you Christians say, turn the other cheek. We say, you mess with me, I'll knock your teeth out. He actually said that. So the, the, the oppositeness of Islam to Christianity again. Romans 12, 14. Romans 12, 14. 
Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. See, Christ is the image of forgiveness. He is the model of forgiveness we are to emulate. He's the source of forgiveness. In Islam, Muhammad is the source of dominance, not forgiveness. He is, he is the model of brutality, not kindness. It's, it's just anti-Christian completely. The world is finally delivered in 632 from Muhammad himself when he dies. Supposedly he died in the company, I don't know if it was in the arms of, but in the company of his favorite wife, Aisha. By the way, do you know the name of Muhammad Ali's daughter? It's Aisha. Muhammad's favorite wife. Uh, actually, the name Muhammad Ali uh, says what kind of Muslim he is. He is a Shiite uh, because Ali, as we'll see here next, belongs strictly to the Shiite party. If you see anybody with Ali in their name, they're Shiite. So, all right, so Muhammad dies. Now, what happens to Islam after his death? Next handout. By the way, I actually have the autograph of Luel Cinder. Before he converts to Islam and becomes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. My, my brother uh, used to be in Concordia, Milwaukee, and the Milwaukee uh, Kareem was playing for the Bucks at the time, before his conversion, and uh, their stadium was being repaired, so they were playing at Concordia College Gym to practice, and my brother managed to get the autograph of the entire Bucks team right then, and that was the team when they, the, the year when they were they were it. They were the best team in the NBA, so uh, he didn't want it. I got it. So I have a Luel Cinder autograph. That's my, my claim to fame. All right, Islam after Muhammad's death. Um, as we said, Muhammad is supposed to have died from an illness in the company of his favorite wife, Aisha. Muslims are divided over who was the rightful heir to the leadership position of Islam after Muhammad's death. Muhammad's wife, Aisha, named Abu Bakr, her father, what a surprise, as the rightful heir. Abu Bakr was asked by Muhammad to lead his followers in prayer while he was sick. He's the first caliph. Uh, long title is, is that, uh, Caliphate Rasul Allah, or successor to the messenger of God. When you hear caliph, that's what they're saying. He is the successor to the messenger of God. He's Muhammad's successor. A faction of Muslims, however, believed that Muhammad had appointed Ali, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, as successor. They felt that only a member of Muhammad's family should lead. They were known as the Shia, Ali, or the party of Ali. Uh, Aisha disagreed, perhaps because Ali told Muhammad that there were lots of other women when, she was when he was deciding what to do about Aisha after she was accused of adultery, and she champion, champions Abu Bakr, her father. Now, uh, pause here for a moment. Supposedly, there was a period in time where the, the, the Muslims picked up camp and moved. According to Muslim law, a woman is never to be alone in the company of another man, ever. When they got up and moved, Aisha happened to be sleeping at the time. When she woke up, everybody was gone. So she panics and starts walking after the camel tracks in the sand. And one of, uh, one of Muhammad's favorite warriors happened by and sees her. And then together, they go find the Muslim camp. Well, as soon as they got there, they accuse her of adultery because she's been alone with this man. So Muhammad was going through a period of time where he was debating what to do about her because she had violated his law. And here she was alone with this dude. 
Here, one of his revelations of convenience, however, uh, came to him and revealed her innocence that she hadn't done anything. So all was good with Aisha, which is a good thing because she was his favorite wife. Well, this Ali fellow, while he was deciding, what do I do about her because she's violated Islamic law, Ali gave Muhammad the advice, look, there's lots of other women around. You can have any of them. Just get rid of her. That was his advice. So naturally, she hates Ali, hates him a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and Ali was Muhammad's right-hand man. He was kind of the guy closest to him. Uh, so Muhammad does not name a successor when he dies. There's this power struggle. Aisha has her party, her father. Not a blood relative, though, to Muhammad. Uh, Ali is a blood relative. He's a cousin. So he has a following, too. And this is where the Shia party begins. It's Ali's party. We call them Shiites. I guess Shia is supposed to be the, the way to say it. So here's the list of caliphs, successors to Muhammad. Uh, there's this Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law. He reigns two years. He's known for declaring jihad against the Byzantine Christians, which he dies before he's able to actually carry out. Uh, Umar, or Umar, you occasionally we'll see somebody on the news named Omar, who is some terrorist. That's, he's named after this guy. Another father-in-law to Muhammad. Yeah, he had multiple father-in-laws, at least 12 of them. Famous for capturing Jerusalem and Damascus, that's in Syria. He reigns 10 years and is assassinated by a Persian Christian. Go Persian Christians. He's... Supposedly was a craftsman, stabbed him to death. Um, this also explains why Syria is such a target for ISIS. Because um, it was this, this conquering of Damascus. Once, once an Islamic force captures a territory, it becomes theirs forever under Muslim law. And if you take it back, it doesn't change the fact that it's theirs and now you are stealing their land if you go and defend it and take it back. So they have claimed Damascus already back here under uh, Omar. So now they believe they have a right to it, which is why ISIS is centered in Syria. The next one, uh, Uthman, son-in-law of Mohammed, is assassinated by fellow Muslims. Uh, he reigns about 12 years. He's credited with gathering the sayings of Muhammad into a single text, the Quran. Uh, there were numerous versions of Muhammad's sayings floating around that did not disagree, or that rather that did disagree with each other. Uthman picks the ones he wants. This forms the Quran. All of the other ones that disagreed, he had burned. When Muslims claim that their Quran is a, uh, is a divinely inspired text that does not contradict itself anywhere, the reason it doesn't contradict itself is because they burned all the other copies that did contradict it. A point of fact, in the very beginning when the Quran was being amassed, it did contradict itself all over the place. That's why he burned the copies. There were at least 13 different versions of the Quran floating around. He burns 12 of them, keeps one. And now Muslims run around and say, but our text never contradicts itself. Well, yeah, it does. All right. Uh, Ali, finally, the son-in-law, the cousin, the blood relative, gets to be caliph. Uh, he is the first and only blood relative of Muhammad. That's Caliph. He's assassinated by fellow Muslims uh, in 661. Spends most of his short reign fighting with other Muslims who oppose his rule. Is best known for a battle fought against Aisha and her army. She actually leads the armies against Ali. Uh, she's riding around on a camel, so the battle is known as the Battle of the Camel. Ali was victorious. He defeats Aisha and her forces. This explains why you see today Shias and Sunnis blowing each other up. 
It goes all the way back to here and the fight of making Ali caliph. Um, the, um, just recently, in fact, I think this last week, there were four, let's see, this is in Yemen, there were four Sunni um, suicide bombers that walked into two mosques in, in Yemen. Did you see this? Killed 135, I think, people. Injured 300 something. Blowing their, their own people up. It goes all the way back to here. That's how old that hatred is. It dates back to the 660s. You know, this is a, this is a 1400 year hate fest that's as vicious now as it's ever been. And it's all over, it's all over who should be caliph. And the Shiites say it's got to be a blood relative of Muhammad. The Sunnis say it doesn't have to be a blood relative. That's all they're fighting about. All right. Uh, the next guy, the fifth one, I can't even pronounce that. He was the leader of the fight against Ali, so he would be what we'd call a Sunni. He takes over as caliph, and when he takes over, he establishes the rule that from now on, the caliphate is going to be hereditary, not elected. So all of his descendants, his sons and their sons, become caliph thereon until about 750. Um, one thing about ISIS right now, and ISIS is Sunni, uh, as is Al-Qaeda, by the way, so they don't believe it has to be a blood relative of Muhammad. But ISIS has elected a dude as caliph. They claim to have the next caliph. And supposedly, according to them anyway, there's only a, one or two more caliphs after him. I think two more caliphs and then the end of the world is coming. Um, but the, this caliphate now is condensed into the family of this guy. At least for 100 hundred years or so. Now, Shia versus Sunni. As stated above, Shia believed that Ali was the rightful heir to Muhammad. Sunnis followed the teachings known as the Sunnah, or the traditions or customs of Muhammad. Sunnah, traditions, a.k.a. the well-trodden path. Yeah, the word Sunni means traditions. The word Shia means party. So Shias designate themselves as the party of Ali, Sunnis designate themselves as we follow the traditions of the Sunnah, which is like the Hadith, it's a, it's a record of the life of Muhammad, the, the history, stories of his, of his life. Sunnis make up roughly 90% of all Muslims. Shia, 10%. Uh, Shia's main stronghold is in Iraq, Iran, and Yemen. Those are the three places where, where the Shiites have a majority. Um, one of the reasons why Iraq, of all places, is leading the charge against ISIS has nothing to do with them being noble, wanting to step up and bring world peace. It has to do with the fact that they're Shiites, and they hate Sunnis with a passion. And this is their opportunity to kill as many of them without the world being upset with them. So uh, they are going after ISIS because, you know, that's, that's who they are. And why, why it worries people that they're filling the void in Iraq really is, is kind of comical because Iraq has always traditionally been a Shiite stronghold anyway. So it's just Shias protecting fellow Shias is what it is. Uh, we don't see Iraq running into Syrian territory or Iran running into Syrian territory necessarily. It's Iraq they're protecting. Why Iraq? Because that's traditional Shiite ground. And same with Yemeni, they, or Yemen rather. They will help in Yemen because that's traditional Shiite ground. All right, any questions or thoughts? The next bit is a quote I found. Um, this shows you something of the, the Muslim mindset towards Muhammad. Where is the beginning of this thing? 
Oh, there it is, page. Okay, no, I got ahead of myself. Sorry, got the wrong page. Uh, here, here is the, the on page two. Here is the idea of the the uh, Muslim Messiah, the Mahadi. Uh, literally the rightly guided one. He's a messianic figure of Islam who will come at judgment day to purify the world by making Islam the only religion. His coming is predicted in the Hadith. That's, again, the stories about Muslims li uh, Muhammad's life. Both Sunnis and Shias agree that he will be a descendant of Muhammad. Supposedly, he will be named Muhammad, and he will appear at roughly the same time as the Antichrist or the Great Satan will appear. They also seem to believe that his coming will coincide with a solar eclipse during Ramadan. Some sources suggest it's going to be a double solar eclipse, though evidently that tradition is somewhat less attested to than others. Uh, and they also believe that false Mahadis will arise and claim to be the rightly guided one. What does that sound like? Jesus saying that false Christs will arise as if to deceive the elect. It parallels what Jesus says about himself. Uh, Shia Islam has a more developed doctrine about the Mahadi. Many Shia believe that the Mahadi was born in 869 and was taken by Allah when he was five years old and will return in the end times as the prophesied redeemer. These Shia believe he will have black hair and dark eyes. They further believe that he will come in an odd year and will first appear in Mecca at the Kaaba, which is the big black box. People will initially fear him, but eventually many will follow him. So they are expecting the return of a messianic figure who will usher in the end of the age. So in addition, they believe the Mahadi will come following a period of great violence, war, and chaos, that the Euphrates River will reveal a mountain of gold prior to the Mahadi's arrival, that a war will break out in the city of Mina preceding the coming of the Mahadi, uh, that a man called the Sufi, uh, let's see, Sufiani, a descendant of Abu Sufyan, will rise to power in Damascus. He will spread corruption and trouble throughout the earth and try and kill the Mahadi. Now note the similarities of the Islamic Messiah with Christ. Similarities would be like the rise of an Antichrist, just preceding his coming, the increasing evil in the earth, and a worldwide savior and final judgment. Yet notice also the differences. Promised wealth and an actual physical war involving Muslims. You know, there, there are two things that are kind of essential to Islam that appear throughout their, their, their narrative of themselves. One is war, jihad, uh, which is a physical attacking of other people. And the other is wealth. Why is Islam so appealing? Because it's all about power and money. They're promising people who are dirt poor, follow us and you get loot. That's pretty appealing if you're dirt poor. And they're, and, and they're, they're telling disenfranchised people, people who are, are the nothings in the world, follow us and you'll have power. You can share in our power. And that's pretty appealing too. My nephew is a Muslim. My brother's son. He's, he's a perfect example of this. He's five foot nothing, about that tall, dropped out of high school, had problems his whole life, never held a job, doesn't have a high school diploma, was going around sleeping on friends' couches, didn't have a car, couldn't get a job because he couldn't drive to it, Spent like 10, 15 years basically being homeless. Um, finally gets a job at a mosque sweeping the floor. And it was there that the Muslims converted him. And they promised him power and money. Follow us. We'll make your life better and happier. And he did. And now he's got a full beard. Where's the little hat? I mean, he's, he's full-blown Muslim. 
I wouldn't be a bit surprised someday if he blows himself up to kill somebody. He's, he's got that attitude. But they take the disenfranchised peoples who are nothing and they give them a message of money and power. And that's the, ha the happiest news people like that could hear. Yeah. 70. Yeah. Yeah. They believe in a resurrection. And and I and again I'm not entirely sure yet. I haven't read enough whether their version of a resurrection is anything similar to a Christian's where there's a new heaven and a new earth, or whether it's something more akin to Jehovah Witnesses that have an earthly resurrection for those who aren't quite good enough to make a heavenly one. So I don't know which of the two it is, but they do believe in a resurrection. They do believe that, that um, the men will be rewarded with all kinds of things in the afterlife, including money and women. But yeah, whether it's in heaven or on earth, I don't know. Any other comments? We're about time here. All right. Let's stop there, then we'll pick it up next time on the Islamic view of Muhammad. Yeah, you know, considering, considering my family is basically Midwest German, that we have had a couple of instances of family members either marrying or becoming Muslims. This kind of hits close to home and goes to show that this can happen to anybody. Um, if you're given a choice between be a Christian and suffer, you're not going to have any worldly glory or honor. The world isn't going to like you. It's going to be a hard life, but Christ loves you. Or you're given an option between, we'll give you power, we'll make your life happier, you'll be wealthy. You're given those options. A lot of people choose the, well, I want to be happy and wealthy and powerful. What Christianity offers does not logically make sense to somebody who's rooted in this world. You get the love of God and eternal life, but for now, you're going to not have a great life. So the appeal of it all is the sort of appeal that can reach anybody. Anybody who is feeling weak and powerless and is tired of being stomped on by others all the time. Um, it's a psychologically very attractive philosophy. You bet it is. Absolutely it is. Um, he's got a job. My nephew. Um, I don't know that his life is any better. When he comes to visit my brother, he actually even brings his little prayer rug. My brother, every time he says he has to pray, throws him out of the house. He has to do his prayers five times a day, facing Mecca. Yeah. All right, let's close. Gracious Father, we do thank you for the truth that you have given us and pray for those who are in lands where they are persecuted for their Christian faith. We pray you give them strength and support and that you help them make a clear confession even in the face of death. For Jesus' sake, amen.